Great, uh, thanks for the intro, Wes. All right, so this is work called Regression by Eye uh, with myself and Jeff here uh, at the University of Washington in the Interactive Data Lab. And what I mean by regression by eye, probably important to establish before I start talking about it, is this visual uh, estimation of trends in visualizations, especially bivariate visualizations. So just when we look at charts like scatter plots, how do we assess the trend that's going on? Um, and I think it's important to investigate the space because regression by eye is something we do all the time. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of work, um, here is a visualization, I don't know if you can read it, but it's M. Night Shyamalan's uh, movies over time, and the y-axis is their rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so maybe you can't read the individual data values, and you can't see that, for instance, you know, Signs is very highly rated, but his uh, other movies aren't. Um, but I'd argue that a lot of the persuasive content of this chart is just the general downward slope of those linear trends. Right? So M. Night Shyamalan's movies are getting worse and worse is an important part of the, the message of this chart. Um, right? And in the same way, I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, this is a chart from William Playfair from the late 18th century showing the uh, national debt of England. And it's an increasing trend. But more than that, I'd say that just by eyeballing it, you can tell that it's actually sort of exponentially increasing. And I'd argue that's an important part of that chart as well, that the national debt is increasing exponentially, and we need to get a hold of it before it gets out of hand. Um, one last task. Uh, so here, uh, the x-axis is uh, per capita spending on healthcare, and the y-axis is uh, life expectancy. And um, so one of the things you might notice is that there does appear to be a linear trend here, um, but the US is over on the right. Right, so part of the, the point of this is that there exists a trend and there exists a point, the United States, that is an outlier to this trend. Um, so you all seem to buy all of those messages uh, but none of you took out your calculators and calculated your Pearson's correlations and your, uh, your trends, right? You're visually estimating these things. And these are two different approaches to investigating trends in visualization, um, and they have different affordances, um, right? So explicit calculation requires that you know the stats and you do them, uh, but I think a lot of people can do these sort of visual estimations. Right. So that's what I mean by saying that we do regression by eye all the time and that it's an important part of how we design charts. Uh, but that naturally leads to some research questions. Um, so one is, are we good at it? Right? If you're completely unable to read these trends correctly and they're an important part of how these visualizations are interpreted, then that's a problem. Um, the second is we have these two approaches to investigating trends, these visual and, and explicit approaches. Um, if they're widely divergent, that's a problem too. Um, and then the last is that we could be biased or somehow sort of uh, incapable of making these judgments in certain scenarios, and we need to identify what those scenarios are so we know as designers when we need to intervene. So these are the three questions that we assessed in a series of experiments. Um, I'm going to go through them one at a time, but just to give you guys a quick preview, the fact that this is real data means that the answers to these questions are all sometimes. Um, so we'll investigate exactly when those are the case. Um, but before I do, I'm going to take you on a quick detour, which is why not just always show the trend line, right? If we're in any way worried about how people are performing regression by eye, why not just always throw the trend line on there just in case? Um, and that's because I think regression by eye has sort of two nice properties. Uh, so one is that it's parsimonious. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, so here is a chart of Apple's revenue over time. And through regression by eye, I would argue that you can say their revenue seems to be increasing. Uh, maybe it's flattening out, maybe it's not. Um, but if we really just, if we're not sure that people are going to get that, we can always throw the trend line on top. Uh, it actually predicts negative revenue for 2006, so it messes with the axes a little bit. Um, but maybe we're not sure if it's a linear or nonlinear trend, so let's put both trend lines just in case. And of course, it's very irresponsible to present a derived statistical quantity like this without showing the error. Uh, so let's run an F test up top and let's throw a confidence band on that. Right, okay, this seems like a straw man, right? But there's, you know, there's sort of two types of complexity that we had to spend from our limited budget of, of complexity here. So one is we, we have to now explain to our viewers what an F test is and what it means that we got P of less than 05 on it. And we threw all of these additional marks on top of our visualization. Um, but if our goal is just to get people to see that Apple was making more money over time, uh, I'd argue we don't need that expense, right? So regression by AI, if it works, is, is parsimonious in that sense, is that we, we can use our budget for other things. Um, 
And the second is that it's robust. It sort of has fewer parameters than many of the things that we talked about. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with Anscombe's quartet. Uh, if you're not, here is four data sets, uh, bivariate visualizations, that have identical summary statistics down to sort of two decimal places. And one of these statistics they have in common is their linear regression lines. Um, so if I just present you the trend line, to some extent that's somewhat misleading. Uh, and I'd argue that just by visually estimating and looking at these charts, we can observe four very different patterns. Um, so on the first, we seem to have uh, you know, a linear trend with some noise, then we have this nonlinear parabolic trend, uh, we have a linear trend with a single outlier, and then we have this weird spatial mode going on in the bottom right. Uh, and we can see that through visual inspection. So these trend lines, to really get them right in all of these cases, we actually need to do some rather sophisticated model selection and outlier rejection to make sure that the trend lines are reflective of the things that I'd argue that we can just see visually. Okay, so that's the end of my detour. Now we're actually gonna try to tackle the questions that I raised 10 slides ago. Um, so are we good at it? Um, currently, that's underdefined uh, because I haven't told you what I think good means in this case. Um, there's a lot of different measures we can do to uh, assess how people are investigating these trends. Uh, Yesel just presented one of sort of these free drawing things. Um, but I think something that's important here is that we would expect different responses based on how people are operating at different stages of the pipeline. In particular, if people are, perf are doing the model selection in different ways, and I think there's different ways of fitting models to the same data, uh, then we might get drastically different results. So I think for this study, it was important to disambiguate model fitting from model selection. Um, it would also be great that since one of my assertions was that everyone does this almost all the time, it'd be great if you don't need explanation in statistics in order to perform these tasks. So a task for the general audience. So the task that we hit on, I am going to call the wiggle task. Um, so we present them with a visualization and we have some parameterization of the model. In this case, it's the slope of the linear fit and the uh, participant uh, wiggles it around with the slider until it fits the, the trend that they believe they see. Um, there's some nice properties of the wiggle task. So for one is that uh, it works for different kinds of parameterizations. So we can do nonlinear fits here. So this is a trigonometric uh, curve, and they can mess around with the amplitude and perform the same sort of fitting task. Uh, and it also works for a quadratic. So here the curvature is the thing we parameterize. Um, and that's great because it allows us to assess a lot of different kinds of models. So how we generated stimuli for these tasks is uh, we generated a set of uh, Gaussian residuals. Um, so if you know your statistics, you know that a zero-centered set of Gaussian residuals is the put-me-in coach for linear least squares regression, right? It's the sort of the best case scenario. And that's sort of what we were looking for here because there's really some great, uh, we, we can really assess it with respect to linear least squares. And so if we control the bandwidth of this Gaussian, we sort of get uh, fits that are better or worse or stronger or, or uh, uh, weaker. Um, and again, one of the nice things about uh, treating it as just adding residuals to the trend is that um, we can add residuals to arbitrary trends, right? So just as people can input these varied types of models, uh, we can also create stimuli across different types of models that are roughly uh, analogous. And so we did this uh, with 144 of our closest friends on Mechanical Turk. Um, and now, several slides in, we're ready to get to the results. Well, I've already told you the answer is gonna be sometimes, just to remove some suspense. Um, but in general, uh, for things like estimating slopes on, on lines, uh, people's responses, we had a log error of about 2.4 uh, for estimating the slope. So that little red envelope is what that uh, would look like on, for instance, a sample graph. And I'd argue that's a pretty small uh, error. Um, as you might expect, the worse the fits are, the higher the error is. Uh, so on the lower left here, if the points were very close together, if the bandwidth of that Gaussian was very small, um, error was very low. Uh, but then as those points sort of got more arbitrary and spread out, the error increased. Um, an interesting uh, finding is that uh, it really didn't seem to matter that much what kind of trend it was. Right, so these nonlinear trends, which I'd argue are far more sort of complex to reason about, uh, people were performing error that was sort of statistically indistinguishable between the three. Um, so I think that's pretty good evidence that in some cases, especially in this uh, zero-centered Gaussian residual case, people are pretty good at doing regression by eye. 
Um, so that follows naturally. Uh, I made sure to say zero centered Gaussian regression a bunch of times. Um, so let's violate that assumption right now. Right, we have these Gaussian residuals, but uh, let's throw some outlier points in here. So now things are not centered around zero. So now linear least squares uh, become sort of ambiguous on how, on how we should handle things. So imagine we have a time series that looks like this. I've artificially added a bunch of extreme values to the end. Um, there's two things we could do with linear least squares. So one is just completely ignore those points. Um, the other is don't ignore those points. Consider them to sort of have equal weight as all the other points in the graph. We don't know what's going on, but something is. Um, and that generates two lines that in this case actually have opposite slopes. So the natural question might be is what do people do? Um, which of these strategies do they follow? Um, so the answer is none of them. So that's a... Uh, so what people end up doing is they certainly uh, consider the outliers, they're pushed towards wherever those outlier points are, uh, but they don't consider them to have sort of equal weight as the remaining points. So they're, they're close to the, this robust line, but they are shifted down a little bit. Um, so that doesn't line up with either of the statistical models I presented, but I, I would argue that this is a reasonable answer to the problem of what's the trend in this data. Um, but it does exist as a counterexample of a location where the statistics is telling us perhaps two different models and the visual regression is telling us something else. So that leads to uh, the third question is, are there scenarios where we really need to intervene, where people really are getting this wrong? Um, and there is. <laughs> um, so we tested a bunch of different fits, but we also tested several chart types. So we have a scatter plot on the left, a line chart in the center, and then we have an area chart on the right. Um, and if you want to play, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, I argue that this area chart is qualitatively different from the other two charts. In particular, it's visually asymmetric. There's stuff that's filled in on the bottom, but stuff isn't filled in on the top. And none of the other charts have that property. And that turns out to be a problem uh, because there's a, a, a bias that's been known in the literature for a little bit uh, called within the bar bias. So Newman and Scholler are the first to talk about it, um, where Marks like bars that have these filled in areas create this metaphor of containment, of visual containment. So the, the red dot is contained within the bar on the right. And that results in a bias in judgment where um, points inside the bar are perceived as likelier than points outside the bar. And that is a sort of a reliable bias that, that trends people's judgments down. Um, so just as we have within the bar bias, I'd also argue that there is within the area bias here. So we have this filled in area here, um, but we don't have this filled in area on the top, even though if you think about it, we should be making symmetric judgments. Uh, we actually uh, have this visual asymmetry. And this results in a decision asymmetry as well. So when we ask people to assess the y-intercept of lines like this, uh, in area charts, we actually got an underestimation of the y-intercept by about five or 10%. Um, so that may not seem like a big deal, but for the other chart types, there was essentially almost no bias here. Uh, so the chart on the right is showing um, just uh, the general bias uh, where we'd expect everyone to have a bias of zero. Um, and we have this large within the bar bias that is not present for the other <coughs> chart types. Um, so that's the one bit of prescriptiveness I'm going to give you for this section of the talk, uh, which is that this visual asymmetry, unless it's very important to your data, introduces perhaps an unfortunate bias. So avoid this visual asymmetry if you can. Right, uh, so I hope those give you maybe a, a little bit of answers to some of these questions and I hope you're convinced that the answer to all of these questions are sometimes. Um, but I think there's a lot of interesting work that remains to be done in this space. Uh, so two areas that I'll touch on in sort of the last few minutes of the talk um, is one is conveying uncertainty. If you remember all of 80 slides ago, I presented this as a straw man example of just too much visual complexity. Uh, I don't think this is actually that bad, right? We should be presenting things like uncertainty and error when we're presenting statistical models like this. Um, but one of the things that I think is, uh, might be interesting is seeing how different ways of conveying the same sort of uncertainty, so here I have a confidence band, whereas here I have uh, per bar error bars, uh, might result in different judgments. So what are the ways that we can communicate the uncertainty in our uh, statistical fits in a way that results in, in people sort of doing the right thing? Um, and then the second, which I think is a little bit more sinister as an area of research, is this idea of nudges. 
so I presented you one example of a nudge, which is that if I want people to estimate the y-intercept of a line, I can nudge them downwards just by changing the visual design of the chart. So that should scare you a little bit, because I think there's a whole category of different kinds of nudges that could apply to this information. Right, so just, again, as sort of a straw man example, um, right, I can nudge people down with an area chart, uh, but maybe if I explicitly label points as outliers, that might be able to nudge people up. Right, so if people are, are less certain about these first two points, uh, it might cause them to, to shift their judgments upwards. Um, so I think there's a whole uh, category of these types of nudges that are worth future study. So uh, just in conclusion, um, I'm going to say that we can rely on regression by eye, and it rhymes, so it must be true. Um, what I actually mean by that is that <laughs> for a certain class of points, um, our visual estimates of trends are, tend to be unbiased and are similar to a lot of statistical methods of regression that we have. Um, but there are a few key exceptions that you need to be mindful of. Uh, this doesn't rhyme, but happens to be correct, so maybe that's more useful for you. Okay, uh, and if you don't believe me, uh, you can go online on our GitHub and grab our study materials and try it for yourself. Um, and I, I welcome questions. Hi, Miguel Nacenta from <clears> the <throat> University of St. Andrews. Beautiful work, love it. I'm just, um, maybe I'm, I misunderstood the presentation or or I didn't catch something, but in your task, you were asking people to adjust one parameter only, is that correct? Yeah. Um, I know that there's probably very strong reasons to do that instead of two parameters, but in, in a regression, you usually also need to adjust the intercept or something. And to me, that feels a little bit like a qualitatively different task because it's two-dimensional. So can you tell me a little bit of what, like, why you think what you did is still accurate? If, because, I mean, if I'm doing a, a visual regression like this, I feel I have to do both in some way, not just one parameter. Yeah, I mean, so we did test uh, those parameters individually, right? So there was a slope estimation test and there was an intercept estimation oh, test. Okay. Um, but we didn't test them both together. And, I can th and so you there's several reasons didn't. for that. Sorry. Not, not, not together in okay. one slider. Um, so there's several reasons for that. And so one is that um, the exploration, as you increase the number of, uh, of related parameters, the exploration space, uh, people don't explore it in sort of a natural way. Like they'll set one slider and then just the second. Um, and once they've set that one, they're very reluctant to change it. Um, so I'm not certain that we would get um, good results. Um, and then the second is that uh, these this you know single parameterization allows us to test a very wide set of models. Um, for instance, for the trigonometric curves, if you think about it, there's you know, several, three parameters we could have tested there. Uh, for the quadratic one, there's also three. And I'm not confident giving that level of complexity to Turkers, but certainly uh, you know, for maybe a more sophisticated audience, that's something that we can investigate. I, th I think it's an interesting one. I think there might be a surprise there waiting for us if we, if we try that. Um, there are no other questions. C can I ask another one? Uh, so, so that's the next thing, is like um, now you tested different shapes for the curves. I wonder um, whether you could anticipate a little bit what would happen if you ask people to also select which, which curve uh, to try out. Yeah, I mean, so if, if you notice, we, we explicitly try to disambiguate those two tasks. Um, in general, I, I expect that we'd get um, some ambiguity, especially as the fits got poorer and poorer, and it sort of becomes more ambiguous, which the models are, um, is my explanation. That's what I think the data would look like. That's certainly something to investigate. Um, but also, uh, in other work on sort of looking at how people sort of impute and predict points, there does seem to be a bias towards linear fits. I don't know if it's just because they're simpler or, or because they're sort of easier to explain. Um, but that also might be an effect I would expect to see. But that's speculation. We should collect data and find out. Really nice, thank you. Hi, Michael, Joe, former lab mate. You touched on aspect ratios in the paper, and I realize that's, of course, some prior work as well, especially given that one of your nudges document for your future work is, of course, an area effect. Uh, what form, if any, should aspect ratios factor into future uh, research on this F uh, phenomenon? Well, I can think of a, a couple papers investigating uh, aspect ratio. Uh, 
coming out of this lab. Um, uh -huh. Right, but uh, so in particular, the, the one finding that we talk about in the paper that I think is most relevant is that, um, let's see if there's a, a good way of visually showing it. Um, right, so if, if I sort of add white space to the X and Y scales here and sort of compress the chart area in a smaller area, um, people's perception of correlation increases. So I don't, that, um, right, so you can actually sort of reliably control the sort of R value, if you will, that people see in a scatter plot just by messing with the axes. So that's not great. Um, but I'm not certain if that's also going to be reflected in um, the fits, right? Because the aspect ratio wouldn't necessarily mess with sort of the perceived slope of the line, right? Um, so uh, I'm, less, I'm less certain about what that nudge would look like for specifically the sort of parameter fitting task that we have here. Got it, thank you.